COVID has left a devastating impact on millions of people around the world. And Malaysia is no exception. It kills its victims with utmost ferocity. Tari anak saya, anak menantu saya yang laki-laki itu yang itu 23 bulan. Tentu anak saya berapa? 26 ya, ibu. 26 hari bulan. Pukul 1 setengah pagi. Suami dia pukul 3 petang. Tapi suami dia dululah. The pandemic has also plunged thousands of people deeper into poverty. Every time there's a strict lockdown, that simply means people cannot go out to get jobs, especially odd job workers. Children have had their education severely disrupted. When school does get started again, some of these youth, especially the rural youth or the boys, just have lost any kind of motivation to go back to school. And thousands have been turned into orphans just overnight. Ayah dah nangis. Macam ayah dah nangis teruk-teruk. Bila ibu ni rasa macam tak nangis lah. Almost two years since the pandemic began, how are the people coping? Is there really hope left for the children who have been scarred psychologically and emotionally by the pandemic? Viruses don't discriminate against anyone. They destroy the lives and livelihoods of people regardless of their race, class, gender or social standing. On the outskirts of the Malaysian capital Kuala Lumpur lies a densely populated town called Jinjiang. This is also where 57-year-old Leong Kwai Kyung once lived with his wife, Leong Pei San with his two daughters, Yi Yen and Yi Wen, as well as his mother-in-law and her older sister. Mr. Leong used to work as a contractor doing ceiling renovations in the construction industry. But he had to stop working after he developed bolas lung disease. Bolai are air pockets which grow inside his lungs, making it difficult for him to breathe normally. The family survives by selling rojak, a spicy fruit salad at a makeshift stall in front of the house, earning a meager income of 480 US dollars a month. Mr. Leong has been advised by the doctors to go for surgery to help treat his lung problem. But the procedure has been delayed several times due to the pandemic. But little did he realize that his wife was in a more precarious condition than him. On June 10th, 2021, his wife, Leong Pei San, began to develop a fever. The family quickly brought her to a nearby clinic. Her condition soon took a turn for the worse. She was asked to get a blood test two days later, and the test came back positive for the COVID-19 infection.
And then came the dreadful news. Mr. Leung's mother-in-law lost her battle against the disease and died. Although he was shocked and deeply saddened by the sudden loss, Mr. Leung had to put up a brave front. But that's only the beginning of the family's ordeal. Just a few days later, the unthinkable happened. All of a sudden, Mr. Leung felt that the whole world had come crashing down on him. One by one, those who were very dear to him passed away. And all these happened just days apart. For Ewen especially, the loss of her mum has affected her emotionally. All Mr. Leung can do now is to pick up the pieces and move on with his life for the sake of his two daughters who are still in school. But returning to normal life has proven to be quite a challenge for them. For a poor family like Mr. Leung, his children's studies have often been disrupted by prolonged school closures. Many had to resort to online learning. And that's when the problem often began. Well, anecdotally, I think as long as you have a population that is relatively poorer um, and has difficulty getting access to the internet, or even worse, access to equipment that will allow them to get to online schooling, um, it will be very difficult for them to continue with education. I think for Malaysia, as with many other less developed countries across Southeast Asia, um, it is harder for the rural communities to survive on online schooling for a year. Because of COVID, there has been about a year of um, no school or online schooling um, you know, for students. Students in Malaysia have experienced more than a year of school closures. The learning loss is one of the longest in the world. It was, however, deemed necessary to help contain the rapid spread of the disease. But online learning has often pushed poor children further down the learning curve due to their lack of access to the internet. This fear that more children will become disinterested in studying as a result of it leading to higher school dropouts. Lost interest in studies, lost interest even in eating. Uh, and so these patterns are not healthy. It shows that the mental health of children and even adults are severely impacted by a prolonged lockdown. The Malaysian government announced that it would distribute about 150,000 laptops in a pilot project to help bridge the digital divide. But there are still challenges that remain. There was a lot of talk about it, but I think access was difficult. Either the people who were giving out the laptops did not get to the ground to give it out, or 
the, la the, the equipment just reached areas that were easier to get to. But the thing is, the more rural you go, the more they need it. And that's where it's harder to send it to. You might have a phone, but you might not have internet access. Mr. Leung and his daughter's story is just one of many Malaysian families who have been scarred by the coronavirus pandemic. Those who have been severely affected are the families that are predominantly from the B40 or the bottom 40% of households with a monthly income of just under 1,150 US dollars per month. According to the Malaysian Department of Statistics, there are 2.91 million households that are part of the B40 group. And they're the ones who are struggling to cope with life challenges during the pandemic. It is a catch-2020 situation, isn't it? Because we want the children to go back to having the same kind of routine they had before, but there are the dangers of them catching COVID. Um, so it's, you know, life and death or education and well-being. How do you decide between the two? I mean, I'm already hearing some of that kind of coming through with some of my clients who've either dropped out or they've converted to more of a homeschool format versus sort of conventional school because the kids haven't, they're just in their minds too behind. They're not able to kind of catch up, especially the kids who are in crucial years, like maybe sitting for their IGCSEs or their SPM, um, you know, and it's not yet possible for them to kind of catch up because they've lost two years worth of study in their mind right and so I think that I would not be surprised if I heard kids who or families who had to make the tough decision of withdrawing their children from school um, I am already seeing some kids um, with parents opting to let them repeat the last one year I applaud the government for trying to make all of these steps to try to make it um, easier for kids but you know there are going to be some that I think fall through the cracks. For thousands of children who've been orphaned by the COVID-19 pandemic, the challenges ahead are nothing short of monumental. They've suddenly now found their lives, education and social relationships being upended by a disease that has taken away the lives of their loved ones as well as their dreams. How can they be helped? COVID-19 has killed more than 4 million people around the world. At least 1 million of them have been orphaned by the pandemic. Children who've had to endure the pain of losing one or both of their parents to the disease. The same story of loss and grief is often being repeated by people across the globe, including Malaysia. June 2021, it was the start of an uptick in infections. Malaysia then had just experienced 100 deaths a day. That would continue to climb and peak at just over 300 deaths a day in August the same year. That was when 65-year-old Sulima Sujak lost her 45-year-old daughter Siti Sariani to COVID-19. Siti contracted the disease from a fellow teacher during the annual Teacher's Day celebration. At that time, her colleague was waiting for the result of her COVID-19 swab test. She was wearing a quarantine bracelet and was supposed to isolate herself from coming into contact with other members of the public. But she didn't. She broke the COVID-19 protocol and attended the gathering. Di pergi sekolah pun gelangnya masukkan dalam baju mana nampak kan? Anak saya pun tak tahu untuk masuk kan dia tu orang yang bagi tu dia ada pakai apa tu gelang kan? Ini tak tahu lah ni dia dah tukar tukar dia. Two days later, Siti fell ill. She came down with a fever and went for a swab test. The results came back positive for COVID-19. 
But because the hospitals were full and she only had mild symptoms, City was asked to self-quarantine at home. Unfortunately, while at home, she began to spread the disease to other members of the family. Pastu beberapa hari juga uh, ayah dengan dua budak uh, tu, uh, orang pun rasa macam ada mam. So uh, KKM datang rumah untuk swab. Dia orang tak pergi kat klinik. So positif. So dia orang pun kuarantin je kat rumah. Ayah dengan ibu masuk uh, kuarantin kat dalam bilik lah kan. Sebab satu warga so tak payahlah kuarantin kat bilik sebenarnya. Satu rumah je. Three days later, City's condition took a turn for the worse. Lepas tu, masa tu ibu um, pada satu malam tu ibu batu batu um, kuat sangat macam sakit lah. So ibu terus call hospital. So hospital uh, ambulans um, datang pagi pukul tiga pagi macam tu dia pergi hospital. Uh, so dari hospital tu ibu masuk ICU tapi ibu still boleh sedar lagi macam semua pakai tu kan uh, pernafasan tu. Jadi Bapak dia pun dah teruk. Bapak dia tadi pun hospital anu tu KKM dia ambil pukul 2 petang ni bang, 2 petang. Dia petang tu dia sana terus masuk sana terus dimasukkan dalam ICU dia. Because of the severe condition that Jamuladin Abu Hat was in at that time, he was put into a medically induced coma to give the body a chance to fight the virus. Sadly, 45-year-old Jamaluddin lost the battle against the disease. He died at 3 p.m. on June 23, 2021. The shock of Jamaluddin's death proved too much for Siti. He heard that his wife died, his wife died, he saw his wife and his wife died. Habis tu saya tak boleh tengok sana, dia seorang kat sana, jadi dia macam stres lah kan. Tak ada yang nak bagi sokongan moral, tak ada apa kan, jadi dia jauh dengan saya. Macam dia stres sangat macam itu, dia macam susah hati sangat, tak tahulah. Di mana perasaan dia tu kan, dia down semua. Dia tu do do doktor tu telefon anak saya yang nombor dua tu, dia telefon. Anu, ni kakak, anu, dia punya kakak, dah semua down ni. Semua down dah. Tak kira lah, tak elok lah. Tak ada macam sebelumnya kan. Dia masukkan dekat. Tak tahu dia masukkan mana kan. Dia periksa apa semua. Pukul satu setengah. Saya dia bagi tahu. Dia punya nadi dah tak, tak berpulsi dah. Dia dah tak ada. Pernah cucunya. Kami itu nak meninggal dulu. City died three days later. The deaths of Jamaluddin and Siti had a profound impact on her children, including her eldest daughter, Nur Atika. Ayah dah nangis. Macam ayah dah nangis teruk-teruk. Bila ibu ni rasa macam tak nangis sangat sebab macam, uh, dia macam tak percaya. Tapi masa tu saya tak berapa nangis sangat sebab saya rasa tak percaya macam tu. Masa tu semua bangun. Semua bangun, nenek saya pun nangis semua. I think that grief for the loss of a parent is already something that is so challenging for a child to deal with, um, even you know even prior to COVID. But I think just that you know grief is something that has taken on a whole other meaning since the pandemic began for these kids because they don't, I think primarily the biggest change being that they don't have the usual outlets for support that they would have had before, right? The fact that they're still locked indoors, they aren't able to go to school, they aren't able to socialize, um, they're not getting the support from their peers or from their teachers or from the community that they would in, the, in a typical situation. The Ministry of Health then sent representatives to the family home to check on the kids. The youngest child, six-year-old Ahmad Munif, was then struggling to grasp the reality that both his parents had already passed away. Tapi sekali ayah dan ibu dia dah, dah tak ada kan, dia tanya juga, kata ibu dah masuk surga lah, tu lah ini, dia bagitahu dia lah. Tapi kalau malam dia pegang baju ibu dia dengan ayah dia, dia pegang aja. Berat, saya sedih sangat. 
you know, where they feel that one minute their parents look fine, right? Or these people look fine, these family members, and then they caught something that resembled a common cold in some cases, right? It's just something they've all experienced at some point in their life. And then the next moment, things took a turn and, and they were gone, right? So for, for an immature, I'm going to say immature brain, but for a young child, this is something that's just very, very difficult to process, right? So I think that the biggest thing I'm seeing is that sense of anxiety. So I said, why? Why did you cry? Why did you cry? Why did you cry? Because before you sleep, you must want to give your mother. If you hold it, 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 you hold it, you hold it, you hold it. Uh, dia cuma cakap um, ibu masuk syurga eh dia tanya macam tu dia tak sedih nangis tu tak For 19 year old college student Nur Atika her main concern now is what will happen to the family The loss of both her parents has affected her siblings both emotionally and psychologically. All she wants is for them to pick up the pieces and move on with their lives for the sake of their future. So, saya risau pelajaran mereka sebab saya takut orang tak dapat nak apa tu tangkap sebab keadaan macam ni kan yang kumpulan tu je lah um, kadang-kadang dia bila kita cakap dia tak nak dengar tapi um, bila kita push betul-betul baru dia dengar dia buat sebab saya takut dia hilang fokus dia tak dapat markah yang terbaik lah a lot of the children have experienced some kind of trauma, right? Being isolated from their friends, not being able to maintain that normalcy of their lives for like really long periods of time. And then also a lot of them have come back with maybe, you know, um, mental health, needing help. They have experienced probably uh, family members who have passed on. Some children, we know about children who've become orphans as a result of parents dying. There are lots of things that we need to do in terms of catching up, not just in terms of the learning loss, but also in terms of the mental health and psychosocial support um, to helping children address with the um, you know, traumas of uh, having lived in a, in a COVID lockdown. But fortunately for her, Nur Atika's aunt, who's a teacher, has been actively involved in pushing them to complete their homework and encouraging them to study hard. In the absence of her parents, her aunt now plays a crucial role in ensuring that all the siblings would fall in line despite their losses. So dia rasa macam bukanlah malas semua dia tak selesa nak belajar lagi. Tapi ada makcik saya tu yang cik, uh, cikgu tu dia push juga dia supaya sebab uh, tahun ni di UP, UPKK dia kan periksa besar juga kan. So dia Terpaksa buat juga walaupun uh, dia tak nak belajar, dia malas kan. Kadang-kadang kita push dia sampai dia buat. All across the world, the pandemic has ravaged the day-to-day -day lives of billions of people. Five million lives have been cut short by the coronavirus. Jobs and economic livelihood destroyed. It has also caused serious disruptions to education. But Nur Atika is willing to soldier on despite all her predicament. Ibu cakap belajar lagi rajin. Bila saya tengah belajar tu, saya teringat tu saya tak sedih sangat sebab saya lagi berusaha. Uh, saya rasa saya tak terjejas lah sangat. But what more can be done to save the young from going down the slippery slope and prevent them from becoming part of a lost generation?
Every year, thousands of students drop out of the education system in Malaysia. And the numbers are expected to rise following school closures in the wake of the pandemic. Although the move was deemed necessary to stem the spread of COVID-19 infections, it has also led to learning loss and widening inequalities among children. And that's especially true among those in the bottom 40% of the population. Looking at the school closure for nearly a year and without proper alternative plan for the children from marginalised societies, I'm talking about those who are living in rural area, those who are living in places without or uh, with weak internet connectivity, and the families without adequate and, prop, uh, and enough devices to be used by the children. Uh, at the moment, yes, the, the government is imposing uh, uh, learning from home or studying from home. Uh, but again, if you look at the way they're implementing it, it's more suitable for those children who live in urban area or for those who live in places with enough and adequate internet connectivity. Apart from lack of access to devices for online learning and poor connectivity, poverty can also affect children's life's chances. It could harm their physical and emotional well-being. And their education may also suffer as a result. That's what happened to 13-year-old Jai Navi. She has been trapped in a poverty cycle throughout her entire life. Being homeless, Jaishnavi would often end up living along the open streets. That's where she slept and begged for food to survive. Her biological mother abandoned her when she was still very young. Her father used to work as a barber. But their life took a turn for the worse when COVID struck. This COVID time, they never go to school. Last COVID, I'm struggling for food for staying, uh, I go ask people food for stay, I am uh, shower in uh, MACD bathroom like that. Uh, I call my auntie that time I asking help from my parents because my father no have to work. She had a big ambition of becoming a doctor. But that dream has now become nothing more than a distant memory. She left school at the age of nine because the family simply could not afford to finance her education. Her situation went from bad to worse after she and her father were forced out of the rented premises for not paying the rent. My father can't pay rent money because they now have works. Uh, after that, the uh, uh, house owner is say, I go out because you never pay rent. After that, we go out. Uh, uh, nine years old, I can't study. I stop studying because I can't pay school money all. I feel so sad because I love to study. I'm asking my father, I want to study. My father say, I know I have money, you can't study. After that, I'm in home alone. I'm, I take one book, read, but I can't read. They bully me, you can't read, you can't do this, you can do this. To make matters worse, her dad was arrested for drug-related offences. Alone, desperate and with nowhere else to go, Jaishnavi was finally referred to an organisation called My Skills Foundation by her aunt. It's an NGO aimed at helping at-risk youth and providing them with residential-based training. Can you still be thinking like your one figure? That would enable them to join the workforce one day with their new skill sets. The place also provides her with a much safer living environment, unlike before when she was still staying with her father. He was actually a barber. He was managing a hair salon. And unfortunately, that's, that's, that's what um, kind of uh, blocked his, his role as a father, because he needed to do other odd jobs or something. 
and what we also suspect is actually he's he's also into gangs and uh, they do drugs as, as by using his premises so that's when Jashnavi realized that the place is not safe anymore so that's when she herself preferred that don't want to be with that same house environment uh, continuously there's some pressure going on and that is why you can see a lot of depressive gestures or uh, people are taking uh, suicide tendencies uh, so these are these are quite common among the youth at risk okay. Today, with the care and training offered by the staff at MySkills Foundation, Judge Navi can breathe easily. At least, she's now in safe hands. She can also look forward to a better life, armed with the necessary skills and knowledge to tackle future challenges. This girl is quite a dynamic girl. I think she can be very versatile in any environment. One thing good about her advantage is actually she can survive. She's a survivor. She's not like any other person being reserved, uh, trying to be depressed. She vents out everything and be normal and very, very cheerful. I think one way, one, one way that what uh, persevered all together with her is actually the ability for her, for her to be uh, resilient with the pressure. But the problems facing children in the post-COVID era are often multifaceted. Their education, for one, has been disrupted because of the school closures and home-based learning and teaching have become the safest way to break the COVID-19 chain of infections. But the move has turned out to be a double-edged sword. It has placed tremendous constraints on children, including the Orang Asli community in Malaysia. Internet access in rural areas where these indigenous tribes live is limited. The community has also been burdened by their lack of familiarity with the use of such learning devices. It's not surprising then that many Orang Asli students have lost interest in learning as a result of the pandemic. Thirty-three-year-old school teacher Samuel Isaiah was sent by the Ministry of Education to a rural primary school for indigenous children. Although he has mixed feelings about the task at hand, he has accepted the challenge with an open mind. All right, clap your hands, very good. Okay. When I first got to know that I was sent to the school, I think I had very mixed feelings about it. Uh, mainly because when I was trained, I was based in Penang Island. So the uh, culture, the society, the school environment that I was very much uh, exposed to was completely different. Uh, and I looked forward to going into a school like that, you know, a school that has enough accessibility, good connectivity, good resources, competitive teachers, passionate teachers wanting to make a difference. So that was my first expectation of going into school. But I think reality and uh, probably God had very different ideas of how things would turn out for me. And when I was sent to this school, I think the idea of education uh, inequity, education inequality suddenly like slapped me in the face, you know, saying that this is how it is. This is real life. Have is finger number two here, finger number one here. The problem is, all schools across Malaysia, including the Orang Asli schools, have been ordered closed periodically due to the pandemic. And that has posed an additional challenge for Samuel. Their challenges are multifaceted. It's interlinked, you know, you've got educational problems, you've got poverty, you've got public health issues and all that. So for teachers to actually, you know, because the idea of a teacher just teaching in a classroom uh, in Orang Asli communities, it's a bit different. We are expected to lead, we are expected to be social innovators, to address social problems that the community is facing as well. You try in the rural setting as well, so you have, can see a different set of challenges in the rural remote setting. So for example, those without access to electricity and internet. So they could not have, um, they could not have online learning. So what happened during this time is that teachers would provide homework package for them and they would, every week they would bring the homework package back home and they would do it at home. So it's more of a self-learning instead of online learning. But the challenges that they face is that if they do not know how to do their homework, they have no one to guide. It really depends on the parents to um, guide them through the process. In the rural setting, um, or around Asli communities, for example, it has been reported that they face difficulty in guiding their children because they themselves might not be able to do so. 
So these are some of the challenges that although yes, we do have a continuity of education in some form, but it's, it's not a very effective uh, way of learning for the children. And that has led to a high number of school dropouts involving the Orang Asli community in the country. School non-attendance in Orang Asli community is one of the biggest problems that schools, Orang Asli schools are facing. So we can expect, and students are right now dropping out of school because they've just not been in school for two years. School opening, closing, opening, closing, and there's just no consistency is what's going to happen. So we are expecting for their involvement to be, to be significantly reduced, the dropout rates to significantly rise after this, even if it's been higher, uh, higher already. What needs to happen is children need to come back to school. We then need to double up on the ongoing instructions, but then also look at remediation to catch up on that learning loss. Then yes, uh, we can then uh, avert this lost COVID generation, right? And so, so that's what we need to do. That's why we want schools to be open so that all that, you know, um, addressing the learning loss on top of all the uh, continuing instruction and learning that needs to happen so that we then can catch up uh, and children can then have an opportunity to, to catch up on all their learning. Because if we don't, that's when we will have a lost COVID generation. The good news is, schools have now begun reopening in some states, following a steep decline in the number of infections in the country. But students' capacity is limited to 50% in each classroom, while the other 50% of students will continue to study from home. For Daesh Navi, being at the centre has opened her eyes to new possibilities. She has now developed newfound confidence that things can be better for her from now on. First time I'm in my case, I'm so scared after that. They teach me how to, you can study, you can do this, you can do more, more like this. Will there be hope for these individuals in the post-COVID era? COVID-19 has left Malaysia economically shaken. It contracted 5.6% last year, its worst ever performance since the 1998 Asian financial crisis. The expected economic rebound this year has not been fully realised due to the resurgence of COVID-19 infections, prompting the World Bank to revise Malaysia's economic growth projection downwards from 4.5% to 3.3% this year. Among those affected by a slowing economy is 23-year-old Kavi Vanam Subramaniam. Kavi graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering in February 2020. And it took place while the coronavirus pandemic began to spread across the globe. For the next six months upon graduation, Kavi tried but failed to secure a job after the pandemic wreaked havoc on the country's economy. But that did not dampen his spirit. He continued to soldier on amid the gloom and doom. That's when he decided to start a business selling masala tea and Indian spice tea. Using his bicycle as a mobile tea shop, Kavi would cycle every day between 3 and 6 p.m. around the vicinity of Brickfields, a neighborhood in Kuala Lumpur, selling his version of masala tea. He named his business Tea Tambi, or Brother's Tea. I want to try something new, which is I've never seen in KL here. So I just want to try a classic tablet, like old people, how they will sell. So I just want to bring back that idea and trying to sell, so that's why I started this. Uh, so good feedback from people so far. And the recipe is, my mother taught me, 
and I did some modification of that from people from customers feedback I tried to change some and I got my own recipe now His mobile tea business got off to a brisk start. People who tried his tea got hooked straight away after just one sip. His concoction of masala tea went viral and he has not looked back ever since. Kavi now has five people working under him. He has a small store in Jalan Masjid, India, from which he operates his business. From there, he brings his brand of masala tea to his customers at various locations in KL. On top of selling masala tea, Kavi has added a bun to go with his tea. Despite the initial hesitancy from his customers about the idea of buying tea from a man on a bicycle, his persistence and perseverance soon paid off. The average monthly salary for an engineer in Malaysia is around 890 US dollars. After a year of peddling around KL on his mobile tea shop, Kavi now makes more than an average engineer's salary. I don't think so, this is temporary. Uh, I'll make it this uh, quite huge company. And also engineering also, I won't forget it. Maybe I'll do something in that also, in future maybe. Since that's my interest, so maybe once I've done with this and I will move on with engineering something like a business, something like that. Persistence and perseverance have also helped 18-year-old Vajni Swara Thami Salvan achieve his dream of pursuing his higher education. He received his high school certificate when the pandemic began to wreak havoc in the country. Although he was accepted to study at a government polytechnic, circumstances had forced him to turn down the offer. He did not want to be a financial burden to his father, who works as a lorry driver, especially during the pandemic. During the pandemic, he didn't get some contracts because a lot of uh, companies were, uh, was closed. So he, did, he, didn't, he didn't get any uh, much contract from, from other companies. So he lost some contract and he didn't earn some profit. My parents are my backbone, my friends are my pillars because at that time they helped me financially and mentally because during the pandemic I was affected mentally. Uh, I was so stressful and aggressive character at that time. So difficult so because uh, my lorry, uh, all the companies closed. So lorry no uh, cargo, right? So I have to on and off. La. So sometimes one week no job, and then after one week or one or two days got job. So even when the salary also after a month, uh, get, um, normally I get uh, uh, two plus. After this pandemic, uh, even 600, 700 also my, again my basic only. So very difficult to run the family. Uh, thank God lucky my wife is working in pharmacy, so they don't never close pharmacy, right? So she can maintain the expenses. Lah. But the high tuition fees, as well as the location of the institute, which was more than 200 kilometers away from where he lived, were the main reasons why he decided to turn down the offer. The fees for uh, government polytechnic, I compare it, it's, it's, a, it's slightly more big, uh, the fees uh, we have to allocate it. Because uh, monthly per month, uh, my parents should have to send uh, around 500 ringgit per month uh, for my living expenses. Uh, and then the accommodation fees and the SAM fees, all the fees, uh, I think uh, per month we have to spend 1000 ringgit, I think so. Even though it's a government uh, platform, we have to spend 1000 ringgit per month for our living expenses because I'm staying at Ipoh. Far away, I have to survive myself with the food expenses, my clothes expenses, all I need to uh, find some resources. Vashni Swara, however, did not lose hope. He sent out numerous applications to several polytechnics. Finally, he got lucky. He was accepted into Veritas University College in Battalang Jaya, not far from where he lives. 
He also received a scholarship to do a three-year degree in accounting and finance, following his impressive results during his foundation year. So based on that uh, results, they awarded me that FMT scholarship. So which we have to pay only per year thousand ringgit for the three-year degree. So I was, yeah, was happy. I was shocked, mixed, uh, happy because I was hearing that news. Uh, only thousand ringgit. Uh, yeah, I, was, I didn't believe at the first time. And then he explained me that uh, FMT scholarship. After I got the phone call, I just informed to my parents. So they were so they also didn't believe at first time. They were shocked, thousand ringgit. Uh, but I explained them, and they, they were so happy. They like uh, half of their burden was lessened when they are hearing the that news. We have to pay only thousand ringgit per year. Yeah, really. Uh, because uh, higher education, uh, we need more money, right? So go to spend a lot of money. So we can't uh, afford to pay that much. So lucky they got the scholarship. And, and thank God and thanks to, to the BAC, Mr. Raja and his clicks. Lah, Dark clouds, which were hovering over the nation's skyline, are gradually drifting away. And things are certainly starting to look up for the country. The number of infections is coming down sharply, following success in its vaccination efforts. Schools across the country are now starting to reopen in phases, and a semblance of normality is beginning to return. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the lives of people in more ways than one. Still, there is hope that things will get better, especially for the young and vulnerable. It would allow them to reimagine their future yet again and achieve their dreams once more, thus averting the prospect of a lost generation.